Good morning. My name is Councilman Rafael Espinal, and I'm the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee. Today, the committee will be will hold an oversight hearing regarding the enforcement of Local Law 17 of 2011 and the regulation of Pregnancy Services Centers, or PSCs. In 2010 and 11, the council held hearings in response to concerns regarding the deceptive practices of PSCs. The hearing revealed that many PSCs are not state licensed medical facilities and do not have licensed medical professionals on staff. But because many PSCs have the appearance of a licensed medical facility, women seeking reproductive medical services often mistake them for such. Witnesses have testified that several PSCs purposefully, purposefully misled women about reproductive choices, providing false information about abortion services and false medical assessments. One witness testified that her clients scheduled procedures and appointments only to have those appointments canceled and rescheduled time and time again in an attempt to prolong the process past a point where a woman can have access to a real and safe abortion procedure by a licensed provider. According to testimony, the non-medical staff at some PSCs wore lab coats, offered pregnancy tests and ultrasounds to determine the health of the baby. Another woman reported that a PSC provided her with pregnancy tests, which came back inconclusive, despite the fact that she was 23 weeks pregnant at the time. A woman in scrubs gave her a sonogram and pronounced the baby healthy and perfect. As the woman noted, if she had not known better, she would have believed she had received the full examination. Additionally, PSCs often choose to locate near Planned Parenthood or other providers of women's health services so as to intercept and mislead new patients. They also have been known to falsely advertise or list their contact information under abortion services. However, these unscrupulous PSCs do not offer abortions or abortion referrals. Their purpose is largely to deter women from having abortions, which they have a First Amendment right to do, but they do not have the right to deceive consumers. To curb these deceptive practices, the Council passed Local Law 17 of 2011, which regulates PSCs that offer, that offer obst obstetrics, ultrasounds, sonograms, or prenatal care, or have the appearance of medical facility. The law lists several factors to help assist the Department of Consumer Affairs in determining whether a facility has the appearance of a licensed medical facility, including whether a PS PSC offers pregnancy testing and or pregnancy diagnosis, has a staff of volunteers who wear medical attire or uniforms, contains one or more examination tables, contains a private or semi-private room or area containing medical supplies and or medical instruments, has staff or volunteers who collect health, in health insurance information from clients and is located on the same premises as a licensed medical facility or shared space with a medical provider. Satisfying two of these factors will suffice for determination that a facility has the appearance of a medical facility. The law requires such PSCs to post signage disclosing whether they have a licensed medical provider on staff. PSCs must also abide by certain conf confidentiality requirements related to client health information. Due to litigation, enforcement of the law was delayed until May of 2016. A recent Village Voice article and complaints from advocates have alleged a lack of DC enforcement of Local Law 17. It has been reported that many of the practices that prompted passage of the law remain un unabated. Additionally, advocates are concerned that complaints via 311 may not be reaching DCA. The council wrote a letter to the agency requesting clarification prior to this hearing. In response, DCA noted that it has received 23 complaints about nine possible PSCs. The agency conducted 18 inspections and in two of these issued violations for failing to post the required licensed medical provider disclosure. Today the council will be hearing from DCA and advocates to learn more about how DCA is enforcing the law and protecting New Yorkers from the PSCs who use this, who, whose use of deceptive practices continue to hamper access to timely and vital reproductive health services. I call upon administration to now um, raise your right hand so, we can, so that we can administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Okay, so uh, before you begin, I just want to acknowledge that we are joined by Karen Kozlowitz from Queens and Vinnie Gentili from Brooklyn. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman. Let's hit the mic and uh, state your name for the record. My name is Michael Tiger. I'm the Deputy General Counsel of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Good morning, Chairman Espinal and members of the committee. As I said, I'm the Deputy General Counsel of DCA. I'm joined today by my colleague Casey Adams from DCA, 
on behalf of Commissioner Laura Lay Salas. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to offer testimony about DCA's enforcement of Local Law 17 of 2011, which regulates pregnancy services centers in New York City. DCA is deeply committed to doing everything within our power to protect and promote the reproductive health of New Yorkers. For DCA, that means identifying facilities meeting the legal <coughs> definition of a PSC and ensuring that such facilities ensuring that such facilities adequately disclose that their services are not provided or overseen by licensed medical professionals. To that end, DCA has fielded numerous questions from external stakeholders, addressed 23 individual complaints about nine establishments, conducted 21 inspections, and issued two violations. As passed by the City Council, Local Law 17 defined PSCs as facilities that have a primary purpose of providing services to women who are or may be pregnant and either one, offer obstetric ultrasound sonograms or prenatal care, or two, have the appearance of a licensed medical facility. Whether a facility has the appearance of a licensed medical facility must be determined by consideration of a list of non-exclusive factors with the presence of any two or more of them constituting prima facie evidence that the facility has the appearance of a licensed medical facility. If determined to be a PSC, the law required the facility to disclose, one, whether they have a licensed medical provider on staff, two, the fact that the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene encourages potentially pregnant women to consult with a licensed provider, and three, whether they provide referrals for abortion, emergency contraception, or prenatal care. Facilities licensed to provide medical or therapeutic services or that have licensed medical providers on site to supervise medical services were exempted from the definition of a PSC. Following passage of Local Law 17, the constitutionality of the law was challenged, and only the first disclosure regarding the absence of a licensed medical provider survived First Amendment scrutiny by the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. The United States Supreme Court denied the city's petition for a review of that decision, and the remainder of the case was resolved by settlement last year in March 2016. In addition to the surviving disclosure, the law mandates that PSCs abide by certain confidentiality requirements related to consumer health information. Violations of Local Law 17 can carry penalties of up to $2,500 and multiple violations within a period of two years can result in a temporary sealing of the premises. Notably, the ongoing litigation prevented DCA from enforcing Local Law 17 until the agency rules required by the settlement became effective last year in May 2016. DCA has worked aggressively to respond to complaints about PSEs and follow up on reports of problematic businesses. To date, DCA has received 23 complaints, about nine purported PSC locations failing to post the licensed medical provider disclosure required by the law. The majority of these complaints were submitted by reproductive health advocacy organizations. DCA used this information, as well as supplementary research done by the General Counsel and Enforcement Divisions at DCA, to conduct 21 inspections of PSCs including all of the locations identified by complaint. These inspections include both announced and undercover approaches. Two inspections resulted in the issuance of violations for failure to post the required licensed medical provider disclosure. Documents gathered from several others are currently under review by DCA attorneys to determine whether the facilities meet the legal definition of a PSC. Our inspections reveal that the majority of the facilities visited do not provide ultrasounds, sonograms, or prenatal care, meaning that they must be analyzed for the appearance of a licensed medical facility to satisfy the definition of a PSC under the law. After careful consideration of the relevant factors, it was determined that most of the facilities did not meet this legal definition and were therefore not required to post a disclosure. Finally, in addition to conducting inspections of facilities identified by complaint, DCA attempted to identify additional PSCs by checking areas around Planned Parenthood locations. This initiative was crafted in response to reports from advocates that some PSCs intentionally locate near Planned Parenthood facilities 
to lure or misdirect consumers seeking Planned Parenthood services. To date, DCA has conducted five of those operations. I thank you for your careful attention to this matter, the Council's partnership in protecting and promoting the reproductive health of all New Yorkers, and the opportunity to testify today. DCA appreciates that by holding this hearing, the Council is giving advocates a chance to describe their experiences and share with the committee new ideas that they may have about how the city can best support New Yorkers and protect them from misleading or deceptive services. We look forward to working with the Council and the advocates here today to continue carrying out and improving our important enforcement work in this area. I will now be happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, before we continue, I just want to recognize that we have been joined by Rory Lansman of Queens and would ask if my colleagues have any questions, because I know you all have busy schedules. Uh, we'll start with Vinny, and then we'll go to Rory. Just uh, <clears throat> thank you, and um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, one uh, question. In listening to the Chairman's opening remarks and, and listening to your um, opening statement, it strikes me whether or not you have an opinion as to whether any of these PSCs have a positive role to play in, in this area? Well, we're, are, we, we're charged with enforcing the law as written, so not as much as to have an op a policy opinion about but it. You, you we, we, we're, we're, we're very dedicated to protecting the reproductive health and rights of all New Yorkers. And the way that DCA can do that is by enforcing this law. So that's the best way we can sort of achieve that, what I think is the agreed upon between DCA, the Council, and all the advocates, the importance of protecting the reproductive health. So to the extent that there are pregnancy service centers that meet the definition and are misleading, um, misleading New Yorkers, we feel very, it's very important that we vigorously enforce this law. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you tell us how many of these um, uh, PSCs there are in, in New York City? I don't think we have an official census of, of the PSCs. Most of our enforcement work is done by the complaints that we receive either through the advocate organizations that we are collaborating with or through 311. Um, there's not like an official roster of sites where someone checks off, I am a I am a PSC. There's no, there's no license required to operate as a PSC. Well, right. The, if you are a licensed medical provider, you are exempt under the law from being a PSC. Right, but one has to have a license to operate any number of businesses in New York City. I wasn't here when, when the law was passed. Um, I'm sure it was explored whether or not the city had the authority to require um, organizations engaged in this activity to be licensed. Um, well, the am I state, correct? Right. I mean, I wasn't. I was not personally here at the time either. But I can say that the state actually is the licensing authority for uh, medical providers. Well, the, the medical providers, but these aren't providing medical services. Yeah. Do, do, okay, let me just put right. it. Do, do, do you ask? Do, do you think that the city council has the authority to require these entities, these organizations? providing the services that they are providing to, to be licensed? I don't think we're equipped to answer that question here today um, because we're, we're focused on enforcing the law as the council has written it, um, but we, we would need to uh, look more deeply into the question of how far the legal authority uh, exists, extends and whether it conflicts with any other state or federal scheme. So I don't think we're equipped to uh, answer that here today. Could you look at that and get back to me? We're happy to do absolutely, that. We absolutely, absolutely can look at that. Uh, again, I, I'm coming late to the party because I wasn't here when this bill was passed, mm -hmm. which was when? when 2011. Was in 2011, right. Yeah. Um, I'd be surprised if at the time the council and the advocacy community did not look at the council's ability to, to require all these places to be licensed. Um, do you have a sense of uh, who runs these organizations or, or, or the ones that you've been – you've investigated or, or inspected, um, can you draw any conclusions as to whether or not they um, are all run by two or three different organizations? Are they all affiliated with some uh, particular anti-choice movement or a, a, a church or other religious organization? 
our investigation efforts, our enforcement efforts are still in sort of the incipient phases, so I think it's difficult, council member, for us to draw any definitive conclusions at this point. I think several months down the road, I think we'll be in a better position to have a sense of that. Also, I'm, I'm somewhat inhibited from commenting on uh, ongoing investigations um, and ongoing cases that have not been adjudicated by oath. So I understand I'm, that, but you've conducted a lot of inspections. We have. We have. You can't draw any conclusions we, we, from that. We haven't had the. We haven't had to. We haven't had the time yet to undertake a sort of full analysis mm -hmm. of how the inspections have proceeded. Mm -hmm. And I. But that's definitely in our vigorous enforcement of law and sort of the collaboration we want to continue <coughs> to have with advocates. Sort of being able to target certain organizations that might be sort of recidivist in that sense is something that we will definitely keep on our agenda in sort of refining our enforcement techniques. Okay. So I, I don't aim to criticize. I'm just curious. The law was passed in 11, went into effect, you know, shortly thereafter, I assume. Well, no, not until 2016. Oh, because of the litigation. Yeah, there was very Got extensive it. litigation. Yep. Went up to the yep. Second Circuit. There was a cert petition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and Got Council it. Member, we will say that... Um, as Mike pointed out, it's uh, early to draw definitive conclusions about the sector, but we can share that anecdotally we have received complaints about organizations that are both affiliated and not affiliated with faith organizations. Mm -hmm. So there is a spread of, um, of organizations that have been reported to us, and obviously we take all complaints and, and then look into them. Do you know if any of these centers are operated by... Um, uh, do you know if there's any any entities that operate more than one center? I mean, based on the complaints we receive from advocates, it does seem that there are entities with multiple locations. Certainly, multiple addresses, at the very least, attributed to them. Right. Can you tell us who they are? Who the who are the who are the big movers and shakers in the pregnancy service center world? I think that I think again. I, I can't comment on ongoing investigations right now, um, and we have two cases that are yet to be adjudicated at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings for which we issued violations. But we, we absolutely can continue this dialogue um, and sort of provide more information as, our, as we continue to be able to assess our enforcement efforts. And as those cases are resolved, we'll be more at liberty to share the information with you directly. We will say that we have observed um, several organizations that are larger than others that have, as Mike said, multiple locations in different boroughs, for example. So it does appear that there are sort of larger players and smaller players that have been reported to us so far. Right. Just a couple more. Uh, give, me, give me one second, Rory. I'm, yeah. I'm going to step away for two minutes. I have to go vote in another committee hearing. But uh, after Rory, uh, Karen Koslowitz has a question, so she'll be next. Um, I understand that winding its way through the courts is a a challenge to a California statute that relates to the advertising for these kinds of ser these kinds of centers. Um, I understand the state of play being that the Ninth Circuit has has uh, upheld the restrictions that California has placed on how these service centers advertise themselves, and and I believe it's going to be heard by the Supreme Court. Are you familiar with that? I mean, we're familiar that the U.S. Supreme Court recently granted cert in that case. Right. Do, do you, are there any restrictions in New York, either imposed by the state or the city, <clears throat> on how these uh, entities can advertise their services? Well, the, when they advertise <laughs> under, the, under the law, they have to have the same disclosures um, that are the uh, that are sort of articulated in law for at their facility. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, council member, the, they must disclose in advertising. Uh, if they do not have a licensed medical provider on staff, which the is the same as they would, which is the one remaining disclosure, right? The one surviving disclosure. disclosure. But there's no other. There's, but that's. Uh, is there any any other any other law, either city or, or state law, that governs how these entities advertise their services? That's the only one specific only, to. Do, specific do you know? Do you know if that is more or less what California requires? To be honest, I, I'm not equipped today, right now, to make draw a comparative analysis between okay. us and the California regime. Last one. Um, you say that hmm, after careful consideration of the relevant factors, it was determined most of the facilities that you inspected did not meet the legal definition of a pregnancy service center and were therefore not required to post a disclosure. So what had they, how did they get out from what we were clearly trying to intend. What was what was too too loose or too tight, too narrow our, our definition? 
Well, I wouldn't frame it in terms of too loose or too narrow. And first, let me, council members, a good question. Let me just frame it first. That doesn't mean that at, oh, several of these um, pregnancy service center sites that we have inspected, we're still, lawyers are still going through the documents, going through the inspection results. So it doesn't mean that every single inspection that we have undertaken that hasn't yet resulted in a violation will not result in a violation um, going forward. Um, I think we can say that the <coughs> experience so far in our enforcement law, which is still in its incipient stages, as, as I must stress, um, has revealed that in their sort of public-facing documents, like their websites, they're not advertising necessarily that they have prenatal care, are offering sonograms, for example, which would be the first element to the definition of a pregnancy service center. We wouldn't have to undertake the multifactorial analysis. Since they don't make, they don't present that outward facing, clear, bright line um, indicia that they're a pregnancy service center, we have to undertake the multifactorial analysis, which inherently is going to sort of create more judgment on our part about which, whether they have, whether they have, are outwardly demonstrating the factors for that multifactorial analysis, not all of which are necessary in the public, are being able to easily be assessed in the public facing areas of these sites on inspection. I know, but, but your testimony is that most of the, the, the sites that you visited, most of the facilities did not meet the legal definition. Now, I'm going to uh, say that they're probably doing the thing we don't want them to do. That's why you, it was alerted to you. So, Councilmember, I should just, uh, if I may, yeah, clarify please. here. So, we, uh, as we also said in our testimony, it, this was, these were not sites that were just identified by complaints. They were also identified by supplementary research done by our team. And so, the way that we approached this was that we cast a wide net. Um, so, that we, we identified any facility that we think sort of initially could fall within um, the universe of places that might be a PSC. <laughs> And then we wanted to do more in-depth investigations, both by sending out inspectors and collecting information there, and by doing additional digging online to see what rep type of representations they make in advertising, for example. So the, um, that number, the, the fact that we said the majority do not meet that definition doesn't necessarily mean that the majority of places reported by complaint don't meet that definition. And that's something that we can look further into, you, into for you. We didn't uh, break them out in that way. But the point I want to make is that we cast a wide net because we wanted to make sure we were uh, looking at as many places that might meet the definition as possible, and we found that many of them didn't. But for those that did, um, you know, we, we focused in, we conducted very in-depth investigations, and as Mike said, we still have documents and evidence that are being reviewed by so, attorneys. So are you concerned, I'm concerned, are you concerned that the definition is too narrow and that there are organizations or entities that are doing the thing we don't want them to do, or they're doing the thing that we want to be covered by this law, but are escaping the scrutiny of this law and the application of this law to them, and should we be looking at maybe tightening up or broadening, whatever would be the right circumstance, the, the, the definition? Well, to the extent, obviously, we are always concerned about ensuring that we can vigorously enforce the laws that we are, we are charged with, um, and as I they keep stressing we're still in the incipient stages of our enforcement efforts, so our sort of ultimate conclusions may change as we continue. And we will always defer to the council on, their legis on your legislative judgments. Um, but we have learned a couple things about um, through our enforcement efforts. Um, as I mentioned before, the publicly available information does not always lend itself to being able to fit squarely within the definition. The websites don't actually customarily advertise that they offer ultrasounds, which is the easier part of the definition to satisfy. And secondly, the facilities we inspect are set up like other clinics, so with guests kept out of private areas until they are brought in to see a counselor or a staff member. The factors in the law in the sort of multifactorial analysis, like the presence of a medical examination tables or a, pri a private or semi-private area containing medical supplies or instruments, they presume a level of access that our inspectors do not necessarily have. Um, so DCA can request access to inspect these areas, but we don't have the authority to compel facility staff to allow the inspections if they refuse, and they haven't, to date, granted us that ability to go into private areas. So to the extent that some of the factors in the multifactorial analysis presume that 
we will have access. That's an issue that we have been able to identify so far in these early stages of our enforcement efforts. And I, and I would add that I think the, the line about who is drawn in and who is not drawn into the definition is necessarily a policy one uh, that I think the, the council has, would have strong judgments about. And so I think we're happy to engage in a dialogue with you um, as, the, as, as enforcement continues, as we're able to draw more conclusions. Well, yeah, but, yeah because our, our policy judgments need to be guided by your enforcement experience. Exactly. Right. So I, and I so think as we say in the business, I would, I would like to engage in that kind of dialogue with you. Obviously, you know, yeah. the chair, the prerogative to take the lead on this. But I, I think that's, that's something that's got to be explored. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is, yeah, we agree. This is Thank very, you. this is important. We're all on the same page and we look forward to continuing to work with you, council member, the chair, and all the advocates here today to sort of refine this. Thank you. You know, as a woman, this is very disturbing to me, really very disturbing. And if a law was passed and we don't know where it's, what's happening, we can repeal a law also if this is not working. Where do these people get their money from? Well, I don't, I don't think we've been able to ascertain that yet through the sort of inspection process that we've undertaken. Well, I mean, again, we are reviewing documents and we're working with advocates collaboratively as we've, served, as we've now ramped up our enforcement efforts since last year when the law became effective. And the source of <coughs> funds is, is not something that we normally would have access to in the, through this yeah. enforcement process. No, but process. it's all part of this whole thing that, you know, I'm concerned how they get their funds. How do people get to go to these places? Like if someone, you know, it almost reminds me, it almost sounds like years ago when people went into, you know, places illegally for abortions. That's what this sounds like to me. Well, some, some, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, been tipped off by advocates, we've received complaints from advocates, um, and done our own research. It indicates some of them um, advertise online or in publications. Some of them, uh, we've received information from advocates that some of them locate near Planned Parenthood facilities, as I mentioned in my testimony. That's why we went to different fi five different Planned Parenthoods to assess the um, locations adjacent to there. So we've been working with advocates to hear from them, because um, I think they're often well positioned to know um, how these uh, pregnancy service centers operate and what we should be on the lookout for. And that's why we want to continue that collaboration. I think we really have to hurry up on this and get you know answers quickly. Because, like I said from the beginning, this doesn't sound good to me. It doesn't sound, you know, productive. It, it's uh, uh, dangerous to a woman to have to go into a place like this and be sub subjected to people's opinions, even if they're not professionals. Absolutely, Council Member. It's a very serious issue, and one um, DCA takes very seriously and has really taken steps to vigorously enforce. And again, we um, are really refining our enforcement efforts as we really have ramped up, and we can we'll continue to work with the advocacy community to make sure that we can enforce this law in the best way possible. You have no idea how many of these places exist? So, so Council Member, the, the, as your colleague mentioned, these distances are not currently licensed, so we have to get our information about where they are through proactive investigation, which we've done, ref uh, complaints from advocates, which we've received and followed up on. So it is a process of trying to figure out where they're located um, because there is no definitive list right now. Uh, they're not required to submit that information anywhere. This sounds, I mean, to me it just sounds ridiculous. We're putting people's lives in danger that they operate without a license, without some of them without professional people there. And, and <clears throat> they're getting their money somewhere, somehow. I mean, the whole thing is like bizarre. And I was here in 2011, and I'm sure when I signed on, you know, and, and voted for the bill, I'm sure it was presented in a very positive way listening to what's going on now, <laughs> I want, I don't want anything to do with it. I mean, that is my feeling. Well, Council Member, I, I think the, um, 
we are committed to enforcing the law as it's, uh, as it's written, and that includes the disclosure if a facility doesn't have a, uh, a licensed medical professional on staff, both in their advertisement and at the facility itself. And so we are, we're committed to doing everything in our power. That power is defined by the law as it's written, and so we are we're, we're trying to get creative, to work with advocates, um, and to do everything we can within those bounds. So because we share your concern that if, uh, if someone is going to a facility that doesn't have a licensed medical provider on staff, they should know that information. That's a, a, a legislative judgment that was made by the council, and we are very committed to executing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Rory did ask a lot of my hard-hitting questions, so thank <laughs> you for that. Took most of my work away, but <laughs> um, I guess my question is, there was a big perception that DCA wasn't going out and enforcing this law, right? Stories were written. Uh, we've gotten complaints from advocates. Um, so my question is, when were these inspections, the ones that you cite in your testimony, carried out? They were in, in the fall of 2017. So they just happened in the past few months? Yes. So, yes. so, so, so since 2006, May of 2016, when the law was implemented, DCA wasn't actively out enforcing or looking for P, uh, PSEs? Well, we, there was a ramping up process, and we can see that there was, a, there was a lag between the effective date and when we really have been out there doing multiple inspections and multiple operations um, at facilities. We can see that, and that's why we're dedicated to really, as we have over the last few months, going out to as many places. And I, I also just want to note that during that ramping up process, we were conducting research internally getting our ducks in a row so we could effectively enforce the law once we were out enforcing and inspecting at locations. But we, obviously we can see that there was a time period between May 2016 and when we were inspecting multiple locations and, and going to multiple places in the same week. Um, but we are dedicated to continuing the efforts that we have demonstrated over the past few months and continue to work with advocacy, or, advocacy organizations and the council to make sure that we vigorously enforce the law. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's a, it's a little disturbing to hear that it took a year and a half almost for DCA to actually come out and enforce this law. And it, we, we, I hear complaints a lot of time from industry folks that DCA moves too quickly on certain things, but in this, this, this matter, it seems it took a very long time. And we're talking about women's lives. We're talking about uh, deception, uh, people getting services that, that they thought they'd be getting in one place and not receiving at all. I think this is something that the agency has to take very seriously moving forward. And we do take this very seriously, Council Member, I can assure you, and, we, and I hope that the ev evidence of the amount of inspections and operations and the outreach uh, we've conducted with advocacy organization proves our resolve to taking this issue very seriously and protecting the reproductive health of all New Yorkers going forward. We take this very seriously and we will continue to work with everyone in this room to make sure that we can vigorously enforce the law. So from May 2016 to the fall, were there any 301 complaints or complaints that came in uh, that you're aware of? We are aware of 301 complaints that came in during that time. We heard from advocates that they um, were having difficulties or tracking where a complaint was going once it was put into 311. Uh, and we worked with them on that, and we've taken several steps to correct th the situation and ensure that the complaints go to directly to the right person at DCA to begin the follow-up process. So that's been rectified. And in addition, when once the problem was identified, we went back into the 311 raw data. We pulled everything that could possibly look like a PSC complaint, and we made sure that that was on the list of places that we are were in, including in part of, as part of our ramp up efforts. So there was a uh, a period of time where those 311 complaints were, weren't all getting to the right place. That's now been corrected, and all of those locations that were um, reported have been inspected or will be inspected in the future. Okay. Um, how does the average woman know um, to make a 301 complaint on this specific topic? Is there any sort of information that's being put out letting them know? Aside from the advocates who have been doing a lot of great work, um, is there any sort of information that the city is doing to let women know that, that, that these, these specific locations are, are problematic and they can reach out to 311 if they believe that they're being led astray? So there is no complaint uh, sign uh, requirement there is, that does exist in some of our other industries but not under this law uh, we do have information on our website um, and we did go through the 311 um, 
system to adjust it to make sure that it was more the public facing information on the 311 online system was responsive informative and helped direct women to what um, to how they could file a complaint and about what uh, issues okay so going back to the complaints out of the, what was the nature of the, tw of the 23 complaints overall the point what was the biggest issue that you would hear I think almost exclusively the issues that the uh, these were locations where the complaints thought that they satisfied the definition of a pregnancy service center and that the disclosure was not, the, the one remaining disclosure was not present at the location. Were, were any of these complaints related to PSCs breaching the confidentiality agreement? No. Not at all? No. Okay. That doesn't mean that we are not, we don't have our ear to the ground mm -hmm. on that, but of the complaints we've received, no. Okay. So I guess hearing from what um, Rory Lansman was was questioning uh, the agency on, uh, so does the does the does the agency feel as this as if 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 there weren't two or more requirements or two or more um, requirements needed to in order to enforce, would that make it the job easier of the agency to go out and, and enforce this law? I think it would certainly it's always easier to have one requirement mm -hmm. rather than two requirements. Uh, but I don't think that we, we have a position on the sort of the legislative judgment there. Obviously, we defer to you, uh, but we're happy to um, have a more in-depth conversation as these cases start getting resolved and as more data come in uh, about which factors are easiest to identify, which are most common, which are most indicative of potentially deceptive conduct, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we will, uh, we're happy to have that conversation. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Um, so I guess my last question, does, are, are, you, are your inspectors now aware that they should be out there looking for PSCs when they do daily inspections of any other business in, the, in certain neighborhoods? They're aware, they're definitely aware of the, um, the importance of this law mm -hmm. and have been trained on it. Okay. Yeah, all of our inspectors receive extensive training and, and many of them have received uh, training specifically on this law. Mm -hmm. um, as this is, uh, it doesn't fall sort of neatly into the category of the patrol inspections that we normally do. So our general counsel and enforcement divisions have been conducting specialized trainings for those that are assigned to these details. Okay. All right. Great. Great. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Yeah, thank you. Let's call up the next panel. We have Hallie Chu and uh, Jean Bucaria. And forgive me if I mispronounce your name. You can correct me if I'm wrong. May begin when you're ready and just state your name for the record. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Hallie Chu and I am here speaking on behalf of Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. Um, so thank you, Chair Esmond and uh, members of the committee for holding this hearing on city enforcement of Local Law 17 of 2011 and the regulation of pregnancy service centers. Over six years ago, while presenting the Upper West Side in representing the Upper West Side in the New York City Council, I proudly sponsored and voted on Local Law 17 of 2011. The council found evidence that some pregnancy service centers, also referred to as crisis pregnancy centers, were deceptively providing consumers with misinformation about their resources and services, including the availability of on-site medical providers or care as well as usage of third-party referrals for set services in their printed materials, advertisements, web content, and on-site. Our legislative intent was to provide consumers with transparency, especially in accessing reproductive health services, including prenatal care, abortion, and emergency contraception, all of which are particularly time sensitive. According to the law and the rules promulgated by the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, Pregnancy service centers must meet disclosure requirements for posted signage at each of the center's public entrance doors and in the waiting areas, as well as in all advertisements, public materials, web content, and in oral discussions. These requirements and the disclosure sign are available on the city's website in English and Spanish. My office took a closer look at how these centers with physical sites are complying with the law in Manhattan. This week, my staff visited three pregnancy service centers, Pregnancy Help New York City, Inc., 
and 229 West 14th Street, Sisters of Light Visitation Missions on 257 East 71st Street, and Avail, New York City, 115 West, 45, West 45th Street. At Pregnancy Help New York City, Inc., we found none of the required disclosures posted at the entrances or within the waiting area. Upon inquiry, staff did say that they don't have medical personnel on site and it was not a medical facility. Their website did not feature the required disclosure either. At Sisters of Life, we found none of the required disclosures posted at the entrances or within the waiting area. Upon inquiry, staff did say that it was not a medical facility but would be able to make referrals. Their printed materials and website did not feature the required disclosures either. At Avail, New York City, we found none of the required disclosures posted at the entrances within the waiting area or in the printed materials. Their website states that Avail is not a medical facility and that their pregnancy verification services are provided by referral to a licensed medical center. Its website provides contradictory information about the availability of medical referral on site. For instance, during an on-site visit, there was no evidence that ultrasound exams were provided there despite their claim on the website. Um, quoting the website, by working with a woman's medical clinic, which operates a satellite medical office on-site at Avail, Avail offers free ultrasound exams in New York City by referral to qualifying clients. An ultrasound exam can be, can be a useful tool for you in your decision-making process, and results are available the same day. This is immediately followed by, note, Avail New York City is a decision-making center, not a medical facility. Avail works with a woman's medical facility to provide free ultrasound exams to qualifying clients. In response to an in-person inquiry, though, Avail staff stated that they don't have medical personnel on site, that it was not a medical facility, and the services were not available in the office. The results of our Manhattan survey clearly demonstrate noncompliance, and I wouldn't be surprised if similar violations were identified citywide. Intentional obfuscation of available reproductive health services demands stronger and more proactive regulatory monitoring approach. I hope that today's hearing provides the Council and the public with up-to-date, accurate information on the larger pattern of compliance issues and why DCA should increase enforcement. I know that Planned Parenthood New York City and National Institute for Reproductive Health Action Fund, formerly Neuro New York, work to make sure New Yorkers are provided with accurate information to obtain the information and services they need and that the law requires. All providers must be held to the same high standard. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Please feel free to tell the board president that she's done a better job so far than the, the agency has. Uh, thank you, I will pass that to her. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jean Bucaria, the deputy director of the National Organization for Women in New York City. I'd like to thank the Committee on Consumer Affairs for calling this oversight hearing today. As a women's rights organization, Now New York City represents thousands of members and supporters across the five boroughs of New York City. For the past five years, we have coordinated a sustained effort to organize and train volunteer clinic escorts to support patients and ensure their unfettered access to women's health centers that are licensed medical facilities. And we've seen uh, firsthand pregnancy service centers interference in misleading women both outside of actual medical facilities in the past and just in general from what has been discussed here today. Especially in a climate in which women's access to birth control and abortion are being challenged and restricted at the federal level, New York City must be as proactive as possible to ensure that women in need of timely, affordable, and medically and scientifically sound health care and information are able to obtain it without unnecessary burdens. As an advocate for the passage of Local Law 17 in 2010, we call on the city and DCA to act to ensure the effective implementation of this law. As my colleagues already discussed, um, we've, we've all heard about the harms of pregnancy service centers that I'm going to refer to in here as crisis pregnancy centers or CPCs. Although not licensed, these centers give the impression they are operating as medical facilities. 
and the public would have a reasonable expectation of receiving unbiased and factual health information and care on these premises. But as we've heard, that's not the case. One point that I want to highlight is because CPCs often advertise and off that they offer pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, and quote unquote counseling for free, it is actually low income women and women without health insurance who are the most vulnerable to being deceived by a CPC. Considering the well-documented disparities in reproductive health care for women of color in New York City and the need to protect all consumers, it's imperative that we act to implement the law effectively and prevent this particular type of medical fraud. Although we are aware of complaints made to 311 about CPCs not adhering to the new law, and we've heard some updated testimony here today, um, to us prior to the hearing, the follow-through on those complaints were unclear. When a woman or a teenager thinks she may be pregnant, it is a vulnerable time. It's critical for her health that she is able to access genuine health care and factual information to make informed decisions about her health care and her life. Imagine reaching out for help, believing you are seeing a medical professional, and ending up feeling deceived or even more confused, or even being outright lied to about gestational age or the risks of abortion. Um, to that end, and to make sure this doesn't happen, we have five short recommendations for DCA to improve the implementation of the law. First, make it simpler to report CPCs, as you'll hear from other testimony here today. Um, people who have reported, and volunteers of ours who have reported uh, about CPCs had trouble. Um, 311 operators did not seem familiar and on how to handle the complaints. And we also advocate that complaint forms are tailored to the requirements of the law, which we think will also make the investigations simpler. Um, we also want to point out that we want to ensure that the process of handling complaints will consider how to manage reports of a facility providing misleading or medically inaccurate information, even one that may have the appearance or an actual association with a medical provider. So as was discussed earlier, if a facility has a medical provider on staff, um, it wouldn't fall under the auspices of Local Law 17. Um, that means that other public health legal protections are available. However, um, there may be indications of deceptive behavior even happening in these instances, and so we want to ensure that DCA is aware of these and would flag that, and then be because they are in the best position to, uh, to relay that information to the appropriate agency. Just a couple of quick examples. Uh, the website freeabortionalternatives.com lists CPC locations associated with EMC Frontline, an openly anti-choice organization that calls New York City the quote-unquote abortion capital. The website freeabortionalternatives.com does not comply with the current disclosure law, but does, however, offer a concerning disclaimer noting in part that, in quotes, in rare occasions our medical staff may be off-site at another location, end quote. Uh, New Beginning Center of Hope's website at mychoicepregnancyservices.com features photographs and bios of medical staff. However, it lists services that are not supported by the established medical community in its list of quote-unquote medical care. Both instances raise concerns that some CPCs may be employing or giving the appearance of employing medical staff to circumvent the law, a prospect that will most certainly lead to more confusion for patients seeking genuine medical care. We want to be sure that these do not fall through the cracks. Uh, recommendation number three is that DCA inspectors and 311 operators are well trained and knowledgeable about Local Law 17. Recommendation number four is that the complaint process and enforcement procedures are transparent and timely as was discussed. Um, and recommendation number five is that we asked DCA to take proactive steps to educate the public about the harms of CPCs. As mentioned, um, how would a woman know to call 311? With hostile protesters on the rise outside of women's health centers across the five boroughs and a new wave of medically inaccurate information being deployed to confuse and manipulate women and restrict their reproductive rights, DCA is uniquely positioned to shine a light on these fraudulent practices and connect women and girls who are in most need of care with accurate information and, me and licensed medical practitioners. Uh, now New York City strongly supports Local Law 17 and its effective implementation and enforcement. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, before I give it to Rory and he steals my questions, <laughs> um, just quick, quickly, uh, ha have you made any uh, complaints against any of the doctors? I have not directly made any complaints, but some of our volunteers have gone through that process. So they have? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Rory? Thank you. Um, looking through your recommendations, I don't see anything about um, the issue of requiring these entities to be licensed in some way or broadening the um, definition of what um, uh, of, of, of what these entities are so they would be covered by the law. Um, have you thought about that? And as I said earlier, I wasn't here when the, the law was really originally passed. Um, perhaps those things were thought about back then and it was determined that the council didn't have that kind of authority. I mean, even though we advocated for the law at that time, I don't actually recall if um, any discussion specifically around that. So that's something that um, is an interesting question that we would want to explore further. No, it, it seems to me, look, I'm a lawyer. I cannot, you can't give legal advice without having been admitted to the bar. And it seems as insofar as these entities are representing to give some kind of health advice or, or guidance. Um, it's not, th the, the issue is that they're representing themselves as some kind of health service entity when in fact they may be just providing their moral philosophical opinion about, you know, abortion and um, other deceptive practices to make it impossible for women to, to meet the timelines to get that exercise that that choice um, so I, I'm very much interested in why can't we license these these organizations that are purporting at least outwardly to to provide health advice I mean I don't yeah I don't know if I could answer that question but I was surprised by um, some of what was talked about in terms of um, not being able to determine that so many of these um, pregnancy service centers meet these definitions. I mean, a quick review of an numerous websites um, demonstrates that they all list out uh, pregnancy tests as ubiquitous. I mean, that's the, that's the quote unquote hook um, to get people in, the free pregnancy test, the ultrasounds, um, just a lot of the websites list a whole host of services. Um, it's, I think it's very difficult for a consumer looking at those sites to to be able to parse out um, whether or not this is an actual medical facility or not, and that's our concern. And, and clearly, it's clear to me that if the majority of sites inspected where DCA has a reason to think that it might be one of these centers, either because they got a complaint or on their own initiative, that, that the law is not working the way it ought to. Now, I don't know if the definition for these centers that is in the law now is, uh, represents the limit of constitutionally what we thought we could at the council at the time thought it could, um, could use as a definition. But I think that needs exploration because clearly if the majority of the places that are being expect, inspected <clears throat> or suspected of, of this kind of activity don't even meet the definition of the law that allows DCA to determine are they doing the right thing and doing things the right way, um, that's, uh, that's troubling. Um, one of the recommendations, uh, number two, ensure that the process of handling complaints will consider how to manage reports of providing misleading or medically inaccurate information at a facility that is in association with a licensed medical provider. And the last sentence there, if there are indications of deceptive behavior that ultimately deters care at a facility that may not qualified as, as a CPC under the law, DCA would be in the best position to facilitate other consumer protection measures where appropriate. Can you just tell, what, tell us what some of those other consumer protection measures might be? For an entity that is not under the, um, this law, does not qualify as a CPC, um, as you call them, uh, like what other recourse is there for the DCA or the city to get them to conduct themselves in an upfront, forthright manner. Well, I'm <coughs> not an attorney, um, but I do know that there are. But you are, said it. What? But you. I, no, I know. I'm. I'm just putting that dis disclaimer. Um, but so I don't know all the exact proper channels, <coughs> but I, I know that um, misrepresenting yourself as a physician um, 
it, you know, falls with under other types of medical fraud and other parts of the law. And so DCA is in the position to then refer that to the appropriate agency to look into. So should they come across this, you know, my concern is just what you mentioned in, when you're when you're looking at the list of the list of requirements that DCA has to check off to <coughs> define a pregnancy service center. The concern is has now been raised that um, some pregnancy service centers may be looking at that and using it as a way to circumvent the law. So. That's well, something that I just want to there's, flag. There's for, no doubt that they're DCA. looking at yeah. right. There's no doubt that they're, they're looking at the criteria for falling within the law and trying to um, conduct themselves or contort themselves to to fall outside the the rubric of the law. Our job is obviously to have covered who we want to have covered. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's something we really need to to look at and to. Mm -hmm. To work on, and again, I, I've said it many times. Uh, it may be that the council looked at this and thought, "This is this is as far as we can go," but I, I don't I don't know. But that seems to be the next the next step here, because we're, we're clearly missing a lot of the actors that we want to be covered under the law and to follow, you know, and conduct themselves the way we want them to um, to conduct themselves. Just while I have you, are are you aware of any uh, state law that specifically relates to how these entities can advertise their services, not what they're telling the women who come inside their offices and how they're telling them, but how they can advertise their services. Are you, are you aware of any? I'm not aware of a state law. I know that many years ago um, a federal law, the Stop Deceptive Advertising um, Act, was introduced by Congresswoman Maloney, and I don't believe that it ever... Um, went anywhere, but... Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next panel, Cam Camilla Brown, Christina Chang, Cynthia Calixti, and Emily Kadar. Is the, is the mic on? Oh, yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name's Camelia Brown. I'm a legislative fellow at the New York Civil Liberties Union, and I'll be testifying on the organization's behalf today. The New York Civil Liberties Union, or NICLU, is grateful for the opportunity to provide testimony for the New York City Council's Committee on Consumer Affairs in support of enforcing Local Law 17 of 2011. This law requires pregnancy service centers, PSCs, to disclose that they are not medical facilities, with the objective of preventing PSCs from engaging in deceptive practices and ensuring that individuals are not deterred or otherwise prevented from receiving time-sensitive health care services. The NICLU, the state affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union, is a not-for-profit, nonpartisan organization with eight offices across the state and over 160,000 members and supporters. The NICLU's mission is to defend and promote the fundamental principles, rights, and constitutional values embodied in the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution and the Constitution of the State of New York. This includes rights to privacy, personal autonomy, and equality that are the foundation of reproductive freedom, and the rights to free speech, assembly, and religious liberty embodied in the First Amendment. In light of our long history of vigorously defending and balancing these sometimes competing constitutional concerns, as well as our ongoing support of Local Law 17, the NICLU is uniquely situated to provide testimony on this matter. 
The City of New York has a compelling interest in promoting public health and protecting individuals from medical fraud. CPCs undermine this interest. Although not licensed as medical facilities, PSCs give the impression that they are operating as such. Many PSCs have used deceptive and inflammatory material to dissuade women from seeking time-sensitive reproductive health care, such as abortion and contraception. This practice presents a grave risk of harm to women who seek medical services or information from a PSC. Women may rely on inaccurate information. In some instances, they may mistakenly believe that they have received medical care when they have not. As a consequence, these women may delay or never receive time-sensitive health care from a licensed medical practitioner. To address these concerns, the New York City Council passed Local Law 17 of 2011, which requires PSCs to disclose to consumers whether or not a licensed medical provider is on staff and providing or supervising the provision of its services. Critical pieces of this law, including consumer confidentiality protections and an oral and written disclosure that PSCs do not have a medical provider supervising the provision of care, were upheld by the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. On December 10, 2015, the Department of Consumer Affairs proposed and published a rule addressing the law's requirements. After a public hearing held on January 11, 2016, a final rule was adopted and became effective on May 27, 2016. To prevent consumers from relying on misinformation and delaying time-sensitive reproductive health care services, the NICLU supports strong enforcement of Local Law 17 and makes the following recommendations to improve enforcement by the Department of Consumer Affairs or the DCA. First, the NICLU recommends that the DCA create and maintain an e easily accessible and navigable complaint process to report suspected violations of Local Law 17. Since the law went into effect, the NICLU has received reports regarding the difficulty of making a complaint against a PSC, both in relation to how to file a complaint and the complaint procedure itself. This is in part due to the nature of PSCs. The facilities subject to Local Law 17 are unique when compared to other types of medical facilities that are subject to consumer protections that the DCA is charged with enforcing. A distinct complaint form tailored to the specific requirements of the law would facilitate the submission of information necessary to identify entities that are covered by the law as well as those entities that are failing to comply with the law's disclosure requirements. For example, for a facility to be considered a PSC and be covered by the law, it must either offer obstetric ultrasounds, obstetric sonograms, or prenatal care, or have the appearance of a licensed medical facility based on various factors within the law. A complaint form that elicited this information will facilitate enforcement. In addition, the NICLU has received reports that facilities may be attempting to evade the law by contracting with licensed medical professionals to help DCA address this problem. The complaint form should ask whether or not a consumer interacted with a licensed medical provider and the basis for this belief. The DCA would then be able to investigate whether there is a licensed medical provider providing or supervising the provision of all medical services at the facility or whether the facility is trying to evade this requirement of Local Law 17. Second, the NICLU recommends that DCA inspectors and 311 operators receiving training regarding the unique requirements of Local Law 17. Those responsible for inspecting PSCs and for informing the public about these facilities must know how to identify a PSC. They must understand the policy objectives the law seeks to achieve, as well as the legal requirements that PSCs must comply with regarding advertising, 
written in and oral disclosures and consumer confidentiality. Third, the NICLU calls upon DCA to ensure its enforcement processes are transparent and that complaints are investigated and resolved in a timely manner. Since implementation of the law on May 27, 2016, dozens of complaints have been lodged through 311, as well as DCA's website against PSCs that may be violating the law. However, information on the status of complaints is often not provided, nor is information available regarding remedial actions taken, if any are taken at all. In conclusion, the NICLU supports the city in its efforts to safeguard women's access to reproductive health care services and to prevent delays in medical care. In furtherance of these goals, the NICLU calls on the city council to ensure robust enforcement of these provisions in Local Law 17 that require PSCs to make written and oral disclosures regarding their services and to abide by restrictions on the release of consumers' health care and personal information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Christina Chang, and I'm Vice President of Public Affairs at New P Planned Parenthood of New York City. Thank you for convening this hearing and for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of the enforcement of Local Law 17 of 2011. For over 100 years, Planned Parenthood has been a leading provider of reproductive and sexual health care in New York City. We are trusted because of our commitment to high quality services and our belief in care no matter what. Our staff provide a complete range of reproductive services. Every pregnant person who walks into our centers undergoes a full options counseling and is provided with culturally competent, non-judgmental, and accurate medical information in a confidential setting so that they can decide what is right for them. Um, you've heard from uh, my colleagues, and I think you'll hear more about um, the requirements of uh, the enforcement for Local Law 17. So today, I'd like to just share a little more with you some concerning reports that we've heard from our patients with examples of the misleading tactics of pregnancy service centers, also known as crisis pregnancy centers, or CPCs. These patient experiences highlight the need for stronger enforcement of Local Law 17, as well as a broader unsettling anti-abortion movement growing in New York and beyond. Despite DCA's efforts, CPCs have blatantly ignored the disclosure law and continue to engage in deceptive practices to impede or delay patients' access to reproductive health services. CPCs do not use the required language and signs pr provided by DCA, which are really clear and on their website, right, English and Spanish, I wager that none of these were in any of the facilities that they, that they inspected. Um, they do not use the, but instead they create their own signs with misleading language. They post deceptive information on their websites and they locate themselves near legitimate reproductive health centers like Planned Parenthood to confuse and intercept individuals seeking out medical care. As examples, the CPC across our Bronx Health Center has a large storefront banner that states, Plan Your, pa pl plan your Parenthood using similar color and design elements of our health center. Um, in my testimony, you'll have some pictures at the very end, um, so you'll be able to see some of these too. EMC's website includes sections that say, I want an abortion, what are my options, abortion information, despite the fact that they do not offer these services and are opposed to abortion care. These are images two and three in the appendix. Currently, there is a CPC located in the very same building as our Brooklyn Center. Now, the CPC, Bridge to Life, has publicly stated that they purchased a billboard and subway ad in Long Island City and were looking for space next to our Queens Center in order to, quote, reach abortion-minded women before they enter PP. They are also looking to place their billboard near Choices, another abortion provider in Jamaica, Queens. These deceptive tactics have real impact on New Yorkers and on our patients' lives. They delay time-sensitive medical care, lead individuals to believe that they are receiving accurate medical information from a source they can trust, and subject women to harassment and intimidation because of their health decisions. We know this firsthand. This summer, a PPNYC patient was told by an EMC staffer that having an abortion would cause her to, quote, bleed out and fall into a coma. According to the patient, when she asked if she was at Planned Parenthood, she was told that she was not. I'm oh, sorry, she was told that she was. 
And just last week, a patient with limited English proficiency shared that she was looking for, to have an IUD inserted, believing she was at our health center, but it was instead given an ultrasound. After they saw that she wasn't pregnant, the staff told her, we're not Planned Parenthood, and told her to leave. These anti-abortion facilities do not provide legitimate health services and only make it harder for New Yorkers to access care. Our social workers and clinicians hear from patients regularly that CPCs provide false and upsetting information, show disturbing images and videos, and claim that birth control doesn't work. In an era of fake news and increased attacks on health care, we need to do more to connect New Yorkers to quality care they can trust. In my longer testimony, you'll see several recommendations for improving local Law 17's enforcement and accountability, and I urge you to take each into consideration. New York City should create a public education program of the availability of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care services. They should create a more accessible complaint process with a way to find out the disposition of those complaints and how they were resolved. Provide new meaningful tra training for DCA inspectors charged with enforcement and invest in comprehensive investigative research of the city's PCP landscape to better track and assess their practices. Earlier this week, the Supreme Court agreed to take on California's CPC law, making this the first major abortion case the court will hear in the Trump administration. New York City needs to do all it can to provide safe access to reproductive care and hold harmful fake clinics accountable. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Chairman Espinal and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak before you this morning. My name is Emily Kadar, and I'm here to represent the National Institute for Reproductive Health. At the National Institute, we build power at the state and local level to change public policy, galvanize public support, and normalize women's decisions about abortion and contraception. Given our mission, the National Institute has a strong interest in improving the enforcement of Local Law 17. Um, but in addition to that, our organization's involvement with this law dates back to 2009 when we, under our previous name of NARAL Pro Choice New York, launched an investigation into crisis pregnancy centers in New York City. The results of that investigation inspired then Council Member Jessica Lappin to write the bill that would become Local Law 17. And in 2011, we celebrated its passage and what it would mean for the health and safety of pregnant New Yorkers. In 2016, after significant parts of the law were upheld by the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, the Department of Consumer Affairs published clear rules regarding the written and oral disclosure requirements of the law, which are intended to easily supply information to visitors and prospective visitors to the centers through posted signage on site, disclaimers in advertising and on websites, and oral disclosure by CPC staff. Unfortunately, multiple women we have spoken with over the course of the past two years have reported that they did not find such disclosures posted when visiting CPCs. There is also some con confusion regarding how a visitor to a CPC can report noncompliance with the law and concern that when compliance issues are being reported, they are not ending up in the right place. National Institute recommends a number of solutions to address these issues and improve enforcement. Um, these are an echo of what you've heard from many of my colleagues today, so I'll just go through them quickly, but we recommend that DCA create and maintain an easily accessible uh, complaint process to report suspected violations. We recommend that DCA inspectors and 311 operators, who are often the first uh, city employees to receive notice of a violation, undergo an extensive training regarding Local Law 17's requirements. Um, and I was uh, troubled to hear about uh, the, the lack of access to these centers by inspectors, and I think that's something that we should really address in this training as well, how they can access this to get that information. Um, third, we call upon DCA to be transparent in its processes and address complaints in a timely manner. Um, and finally, we recommend that DCA launch a public education campaign to educate New Yorkers about the many resources available to those who think they might be pregnant. We urge the Department of Consumer Affairs to be aware of what is at stake when enforcing Local Law 17. The City of New York works hard to ensure that we have a medical system that works for everyone. We should not allow CBCs to be an impediment to that goal. New Yorkers deserve to be protected from those who seek to deceive them deny them access to real health care. As an organization committed to protecting the reproductive health and rights of all people, 
The National Institute for Reproductive Health strongly supports Local Law 17 and the accurate disclosure of services by CPCs. We thank the committee for holding this hearing today and working to improve enforcement of this vital law. Good morning. Hello, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Cynthia Calix. I'm a family physician practicing in Harlem. I'm also a member of Physicians for Reproductive Health, a doctor-led national advocacy organization that uses evidence-based medicine to promote sound reproductive health policies. I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of enforcing Local Law 17. As a family physician that provides full-spectrum reproductive health, I'm deeply troubled by the practices of CPCs. Patients who request abortion care need clear and accurate information because delays lead to increases in costs and risks of the procedure. I see the importance of timely access to reproductive health care in my practice every day. One story that comes to mind is a patient who I will call Sarah. She was 18 years old and came into my office for prenatal care. This was her first pregnancy and it was unintended. She initially went to a CPC for an ultrasound and counseling. She was told that she was 20 weeks along in her pregnancy. And when she asked about where she could obtain an abortion, she was shown a video of a dilatation evacuation, otherwise known as a D&E procedure. She was traumatized after seeing this manipulative video. And by the time she came into my office, she was depressed about her situation because she did not want to have a D&E and therefore had to continue with her pregnancy. I repeated her ultrasound in the office and found that she was actually eight weeks. I reassured her that she was lied to about her dating and she would not have to go through an D&E if she had decided to have an abortion. I provided her with a copy of an ultrasound and discussed all her options with her. She did not make a decision at that visit, but had comfort at least knowing that she had time to make that decision that was right for her. The CPC that Sarah went to misled her and used scare tactics to ensure that she would continue with her pregnancy. I support the city's ability to safeguard women's access to reproductive health care services. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I, I guess I have a, one, one question that I have is, um, well, I heard in your testimony, uh, from what I heard from NICLU is that uh, 301 complaints were put in, but you received no information on the status of those complaints. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. All right, is that true for everyone else here? Yeah. That's what we've heard from our activists. Yeah. Okay. So the, well, what DCA says, there have been 23 complaints logged, um, and the majority came from the advocates. Mm -hmm. um, are you satisfied with, with the work they've done in initiating 18 inspections in response? You know, I, I appreciate the collaboration we've had so far with the Department of Consumer Affairs, and I don't want to cast them as the bad guy in this situation. I think the bad guy in this situation are the crisis pregnancy centers themselves. Um, but I will say that, you know, there aren't that many, given the size of our city, it's a relatively small number of centers that we're dealing with, and I think we need to be having a really um, rigorous and aggressive um, investigation process. Um, and I think that's what we've been unsatisfied with. You were in your questions for DCA earlier, you were asking about, you know, this gap in time between when the law was actually being implemented to when investigations started. And I think that's something that we have been um, somewhat frustrated with, mm -hmm. is we just want these investigations to be happening and happening robustly. Right, gotcha. One thing, um, Emily had touched on this, but um, hearing DCA's testimony today um, and saying that they actually can't gain access to a f the f um, full access to a facility to make a determination about whether or not they are in fact a, a pregnancy service center or a CPC um, is something that I think um, we really need to figure out a way to so that DCA is allowed to gain access to all parts of that facility so they can make that determ determination because I think that um, what I'm hearing is a lot of these facilities can refuse it and then you can't make a determination and you're presuming it sounds like that they're not um, and so and then you're, you're not um, DCA is not able to enforce and so that seems to be I mean I think what um, Councilmember Langsmith was saying is there are there gaps and that seems like a gap that we need to uh, put our heads around to try to f mm -hmm. to try to fix. Are there PSCs that would uh, post online a list of services that they don't that they, they, that they don't offer within the facility or they don't post in the facility that they offer those services? For example, if you go on their website, would it say that they offer uh, pregnancy tests, but when you actually walk in through the door, 
do they post or do they deny the, the fact that they actually provide pregnancy tests? So the question is if so they fall, do false advertising on the internet to lure yeah, people in, yeah, and then I when they get to the when people get into the facility, do yeah. they? And I think a lot of I think the result of some of these laws is that the centers have become a bit smarter and that they're not necessarily going to you know I think back in the day before there was more awareness around this you would have crisis pregnancy centers that literally said like looking for an abortion we can help and then it would you know you'd come in and it would be the bait and switch. Now I think it's a little different, and you find things like the, you know, want to plan your parenthood, you know, more um, subtle kind of um, misleading information rather than necessarily saying we offer these services and then you come in and they don't actually have them. I don't know, Christina, if you have any other. Um, I, I think that one example that we saw of EMSC's website is that they actually have section headers that say, I want an abortion, what are my options, and abortion information. And they don't provide abortions, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're clearly um, anti-abortion and anti-full range of, of options for, um, for patients. And so I think that those are misleading. Um, they're not saying you can get an abortion here, but um, they're, they are um, making it, um, they're, they're making a statement that can be deceiving for patients who are, um, who are searching for care. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you aware of any complainants to, of bringing civil actions against PSEs? No, I'm not aware of any. At all? Aware. No, I'm not aware of any. No. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Or, uh, good morning. So I'll ask you what I had asked the other um, panels. D have you given any consideration? Do you know if the, at the time the law was passed any consideration was given to broadening the definition of what a, a CPC is so that more entities could be covered under the law? So my understanding from the time the law was passed was it was written in this way purposely so it would exclude, um, for instance, like a Catholic adoption agency, an organization that is clearly anti-abortion but is not purporting to be a medical facility was the intention. Um, you know, I think the the fact that just because an organization doesn't list that it has ultrasounds on its website, I don't think is the intention of the of the law that if, you know, if you just don't say that you provide ultrasounds, therefore you're not purporting to be a medical facility. I think it's more nuanced than that. Um, so I don't think that the, the way the definition is being treated right now is actually accurate in terms of the intention of the law, right? Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know because DCA testified and they're in the early stages. But uh, but it is definitely something to drill down on because it is very concerning that m the majority of locations that they inspected, based on either a complaint or their own intuition, um, proved to be not covered by the law. Mm -hmm. And if you're not covered, they're not even doing the examination of whether or not they're doing the things that we don't want them to be doing. Um, the, the second thing, uh, do you know if there are, there are other jurisdictions that have similar regulations of these CPCs that we could look at and see how they're, they're doing their thing? So um, there have been a few other municipalities that passed crisis pregnancy center regulations, but then they were um, found to be unconstitutional. So, mm. so Baltimore and Austin. Um, right now there's a bill that has just been introduced or is about to be introduced in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, but you know, New York is really, like in so many things, a bit on the cutting edge with this. Um, and I think we're more often than not the model for other cities, um, and which is why it's all the more important. You know, Christina referenced this uh, the state uh, California policy. You know, it's all the more important that we figure this out because I think more likely other cities are going to be turning to us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that all the advocates have, have, have mentioned um, is the need for a better complaint process. Um, I should have asked this of DCA but maybe you know. Do most of the complaints come through the 311 system? I mean, I would think so. I don't even know if a regular New York City resident can even get to, to through to the Department of Consumer Affairs or any other department because everything is channeled 
through to 311. Um, do you know if that's how most of the complaints come to, to DCA? I don't think we can, I can speak to it, um, the full range of complaints. I do know that um, for some of our, our volunteers and activists um, who have got, you know, taken it upon themselves to, to look at websites and see if the um, disclosures are, are there, um, have made those complaints through 311. 311. And it, it seems like what folks are calling for is that the 311 operators have some kind of checklist or or uh, standard set of questions that they would ask someone who's complaining about something that seems like it might be a CPC, and then that would be uh, very helpful to, to, as that information flows to, to DCA to. Yeah, and, and we've been working a bit with DCA and with uh, 311 staff to try to figure that out. You know, I think especially early on, you were getting complaints that were, you know, people would hear health and then it would get sent over to DOH or something when this is not a health matter, this is a consumer affairs matter. Um, and so we've been working with them to, you know, highlight certain keywords, you know, the, the way the 311 process works is very specific. Um, but we would like to have DCA create a very specific complaint process for CPCs in particular because we just think they're very unique facilities. They don't really um, map on very well to other kinds of um, facilities in the city because they're kind of a unique animal. Right. Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chang, you, uh, you, you say that um, posting the six factors as a checklist, the, the mm -hmm. six factors that could make, you know, you might be a CPC if, right? um, posting where? Where would it be posted? You could post it on DCA's website. Okay. So that people can, so as a, as a patient or a potential patient, if I'm looking for it and I say, you know, I walked into this site and um, it didn't, you know, it didn't feel right. But one of our patients could very well do that, right? But then they wouldn't know, um, you know does it, because really what you're trying to figure out is, does this, is this making an appearance of, of being a medical facility, right? So are there exam tables? Um, is there medical equipment around? Are they asking you for health insurance information? Um, are there are people walking around in scrubs, right, and um, and medical apparel, right, to to make to give the impression that this is a medical facility? These are things that um, most people aren't looking for, right. And so if there are, if but if you feel like there's if a patient comes in and they don't they're not really sure, but feel like they've got they were um, there was a bait and switch or they were led astray, we think that part of it is to be sure that consumers have that information so they can say to 311, I have a complaint about a pregnancy service center or a CPC, um, and that also that, um, frankly, it's a, I think it's a tool for 311 operators mm. and DCA inspectors yeah. to have as well. And it, it seems like the, the, the criteria are all uh, measurements of what goes on in the, in the facility, in the location. Are, are you aware of any uh, New York state law or any law in any jurisdiction that purports to govern and specifically for these kinds of entities, their their outward representations, their advertising, their solicitation, which would c include, you know, the big banner across the street from mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood saying, come plan your parenthood with us or whatever. I think that's what, what California's got yeah. you know, winding its way through the courts. Yeah, and, um, and as Jean mentioned, there was a Carolyn Maloney bill that's been right. introduced uh, multiple times. I know that there was crisis pregnancy center regulation uh, legislation introduced in the past um, by Senator Hoyleman, but I can't recall if it specifically dealt with the- With advertising. With advertising, but certainly in New York, there's no current law in place right. to deal with that. So we're definitely going to follow up with you on, on this and a range of issues. We really want to dive into this. And, um, you know, we're going to have to navigate. And, and this may have all been done already in 2011 because, you know, there were equally smart people and committed people at that time. Um, like what, 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 what are the limits of what we can do and what we can't do? Mm -hmm. I mean, even this bill, even this law, which, I mean, I'm glad that it's here, but it's quite weak tea, you know, half of it got gutted by the courts. Um, the last uh, question I have is I'm, I'm surprised that we don't know how many of these entities there are in New York City. I'd asked DCA and they didn't know and in fairness they weren't charged with, by the law to go and 
you know, create a comprehensive directory. But can you give us some kind of estimate about how many of these these are out there in New York City? And are they are they all freestanding independent places or is it three organizations that are running all of these all these locations? So do you have a I think that there are, um, and these are the ones we know about, so there might be, there may be more. I think there are probably about a dozen that we know about. Um, there are several that are run out of one organization, but they have several sites. So EMC has a site in Brooklyn. They have one in the Bronx. Um, an organization called Bridge to Life have several um, sites in, um, in Queens, both in Astoria and Flushing. So I think that um, an Avail NYC, Sisters of Life, they, are in, they also have um, several of these um, facilities in different locations as well. So, um, and it's not exhaustive because we don't know about some of these standalone places. These are just things that oftentimes we hear from our patients saying, I went there and I mistakenly thought it was a Planned Parenthood or a legitimate healthcare provider. And I would also just note that um, a Bridge to Life is unique in that they are the one CPC that has received funding from member items from the city council. Um, there are two locations there that have received funding from two different members. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> Not so fun. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you very now, much, Chairman. I mean, that said, this committee hearing is a, whoa, there's another panel. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. We have Char Charmaine Hossein. Hi, I'll be quick. Moira, no, 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 take your time. I wasn't aware there was another panel. Okay. Uh, Moira uh, Ar Arif. And again, yeah. please um, correct me if I mispronounce your name. Anna Bean and Dr. Patricia Burkhart. Thank you. Um, my name is Sharman Hussain. I'm the manager of youth organizing at Planned Parenthood of New York City. Um, I'm representing Maria Lopez Bernstein, a health educator based in Harlem today. We are a part of a community engagement group at, with the Department of Health, and we work extensively on sexual and reproductive health in New York City. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share this testimony with you. Maria apologizes for not being there today, but I am going to speak in first person as I am her. I am a health educator at a school-based health center in Harlem. I've worked in reproductive health care for three decades. Three years ago, I spoke with a 12-year-old seventh grade student who had planned to go to Planned Parenthood in the Bronx because she knew that she was pregnant and she had wanted an abortion. Across the street from Planned Parenthood was the infamous building, 344 East 149th Street, which, with the huge sign on it that read, Unplanned Pregnancy, this escorted, tw this unescorted 12 year old saw the sign and she assumed that this was the Planned Parenthood clinic her older friend had told her about. She walked in. The girl relayed her experience to me. She told me that the staff at the center said that she believed she was pregnant and wanted a con confidential abortion because she didn't want her parents to find out that she had gotten pregnant. The girl said she was told that she was in the right place. At the center, she was counseled by a staff person who told her abortion would kill her unborn baby by ripping it apart, and she was then shown a video of a fetus in a more advanced stage of development inside of the womb, and then another of a dismembered fetus. She was made to feel ashamed for feeling that abortion was an answer to her unintended pregnancy. She was coerced into calling her mother, at that time, her mother was strongly encouraged by the staff to go into the clinic immediately. Her mom did so. The girl agreed to have me contact her mother separately, and I told her mother about the event and conversations that had happened in this health clinic. Her mom was related the same counseling when she went into this health center, and videos were shown to her as well. Still, her mom wanted her daughter to have an abortion, the daughter was now conflicted. Her mom said that she felt coerced into calling her husband after by the same staff at this health clinic. Her husband could not leave work to go to the center, so an appointment was made for their return in the following day. Her mom was said 
that she was made to feel that she would not be a good parent or a wife if she were not to return the same day with the husband. Her dad had experienced the same exact counseling the next day by the staff at the center. They were shown counseling and videos again. Her dad then decided her daughter was going to continue the pregnancy to term. That girl became a mother at 13 years old. Another quick story to share was an experience a homeless woman shared with Maria over 20 years ago. She went to see seek an abortion and end up at a CPC by accident. She was told that if she stayed with them, they would provide her with shelter and food and help her take care of the baby. She stayed. Then she said a few months later, she was kicked out and told she had to leave. She was handed a bag with baby clothes and was instructed to go to a hospital for medical care. She was now homeless again with a child. She came to the hospital that Maria worked at at the time seeking an abortion. Her medical provider examined her and found her to be 36 weeks pregnant and in the early stages of labor. An abortion was no longer possible. I felt then and I still feel today that these are horrific stories of violations of a person's right to reproductive freedom and privacy. These women are disrespected and dishonored when sneaky techniques, falsehoods, and wordplay are all utilized in a coercive and deceitful manner to get their anti-abortion rhetoric across to unsuspecting women and family members during a most vulnerable time in their life. This is wrong, unjust, and illegal. More needs to be done. Thank you, Maria Lopez. Um, good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Mora Ariev. Um, I'm a volunteer clinic escort and an abortion rights activist here in New York City. I was invited today um, to provide testimony regarding my own personal recent experiences attempting to report pregnancy service centers to DCA for noncompliance with disclosure requirements per Local Law 17. Um, these are related in more detail in my longer testimony, my written testimony, um, and they are as recent as last Thursday when I most recently followed up on my complaints. Um, as you have heard, and as I again can personally attest, the process of registering these complaints and having them addressed has been extremely difficult and confusing. If I had not been told by people I knew at women's advocacy organizations about the complaint form on 311.gov, or even to go through 311, I would not have made any progress at all. Um, first, some background. Um, last summer, I participated in a volunteer project to canvas New York City abortion providers regarding the activities of anti-abortion protesters at their facilities. We wanted to create a really exhaustive list of providers, so we turned to Google search, Google Maps, Yelp, et cetera, using search terms like abortion and abortion provider. Needless to say, this turned up numerous um, so-called crisis pregnancy centers, or CPCs, and we looked at their websites very carefully to determine whether they were, in fact, legitimate abortion providers. Um, we saw numerous websites that clearly were not providers and seemed to us very deceptive. I started researching whether there was, in fact, a way to report that deception, and that's how I first learned about Local Law 17 and the required disclosure language. On no CPC website that I looked at did I see that disclosure language. On August 4th, um, and then on September 12th of this year, I filed three complaints about two sites in particular, um, Abortos NYC and Avail NYC. One of those was a follow-up complaint. Um, Avail's uh, website says that they provide, quote, laboratory quality HCG urine pregnancy tests unquote, and, quote, ultrasound exams, which measure the viability and length of a pregnancy by referral to a women's medical clinic, period. There is no reference to a medical provider supervising. Um, they also, by the way, on their website have HIPAA disclosure language, um, which I understand is something that medical providers are required to have. Um, Abortus NYC came up in search engines as a medical center, a women's health clinic, a family planning center, and a pregnancy care center. They advertise free pregnancy tests and indicate that they provide free help to apply for health insurance and Medicaid. Um, I was only alerted to there being a CPC by this language on their website, um, and I quote, main abortion risks, bleeding, infections, allergic reactions, 
inner organs damage and emotional damage, unquote. Um, there's some website screenshots, by the way, on the last three pages um, of my written testimony. Um, in early August, I called 311 to make a formal complaint about what I um, called to the phone representatives a fake abortion clinic advertising online. Um, the representative I spoke with forwarded me to the Internet Fraud Division at the New York State Office of the Attorney General. Um, that rep um, offered me a complaint form that addressed internet fraud. When I asked to um, file that complaint online and saw the complaint form, it was very clear that that wasn't an appropriate form to use for that complaint. Um, that's when I did some more research and learned about um, going through 311. Um, when I did find the form on 311, and by the way, in August, that was very difficult to find. You couldn't navigate to it through 311.gov. You had to go to the search bar in 311.gov. You would not find it under abortion. You would only find it under pregnancy complaint. Um, that, I will say, however, has subsequently been corrected. Between early August and mid-September, that was corrected. Um, when, however, I tried to file the complaint again using the form on 311, I, was, uh, I subsequently received an email notification that my complaint was closed because the OAG had, quote, already sent me a complaint form, um, even though I never actually filed that complaint. Um, I, it was a catch-22. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> couldn't, you know, couldn't report through 311. Um, I tried again about six weeks later on September 12th um, through the 311.gov website. I found the, um, again, the Pregnancy Service Center complaint form and filed um, a follow-up claim about um, Abortos NYC and a new complaint about Avail NYC. Um, it was clear, however, once I started using that form, that it was really designed for submitting a complaint about physical signage at the facility's location, not for reporting advertising or website or verbal discussion, even though the description of the form references those. Um, I don't know, by the way, whether my complaints are counted among the 23 um, DCA says they received. I imagine they are. Um, I called again on November 9th after not having heard anything for two months regarding either complaint. Um, first, I, I called to follow up about the Avail NYC complaint. The representative at 311 I reached was not familiar with the issue of complaints about pregnancy service centers. She said she had no information on status. I was bounced around to different areas. I had to explain the law to every single service rep I spoke to but one. I was dis disconnected once, and two reps played volleyball with my complaint. No, we don't handle that, they handle that. No, we don't handle that, they handle that. Um, finally, one representative took all the information, put me on hold. When she got back on the line, she told me the complaint had been closed without an inspection because they had, quote, requested further information that I hadn't submitted. I told her I had not received any notification about needing more information. She reiterated that it had been closed for this reason and that I would have to start over again and file a new complaint. I don't know, by the way, whether any of the other reps I spoke to on that call, um, why they didn't have access to that information. When I then called about my second complaint, this is about Abortos NYC, I did reach a representative who was knowledgeable about the law. But when I related that the complaint was actually about their website, not about a physical location, the representative, um, who again was knowledgeable about the compliance issue, told me that, quote, they don't take this at all, only businesses with street addresses. She suggested I file the, uh, contact the FCC and file a complaint with them. Um, I inquired about the status information that I had received on um, the so-called service uh, notification, SRN service request notification that said something about conducting an inspection within 35 days. Um, she said, no, no, no 35 days. Um, it would take four to six weeks for an inspection. And quote, they just started taking these complaints about a month ago. Um, and mind you, this is on November 9th. Um, but then again, she reiterated that they only handle complaints about physical locations um, that I would have to file a complaint with the FCC. Um, I was very persistent. Um, annoyingly so. I went so far as to read her the language of the complaint form, introducing the complaint form on 311.gov, affirming that it referenced complaints about website and advertising. She put me on hold for an extended period. 
um, when she returned, she told me that, quote, the complaint is being looked into by the DCA legal division, unquote, and I would be contacted by them. She had no case number, no timeline. She was not able to give me any way to follow up, and she suggested I wait until I hear from them. Um, neither CPC's website has been changed at all. They are still exactly as they were when I saw them. So based on these experiences, um, I'd love to make the following recommendations um, to make the reporting process easier and more effective. Um, first, I, I do believe that the city employees who handle calls to 311 do need to be educated about Local Law 17th and compliance issues and do need to be informed about where to refer those calls, to whom to refer those calls. Um, the compliance form, the complaint form online, should be changed so that one can explicitly report different types of noncompliance, physical signage, websites, social media, other kinds of advertising, verbal discussion at the facility, and also so that multiple types of noncompliance can be reported at once. Right now, the, it's really about a specific, one specific complaint. Um, also, clarify which office or division will manage the complaints. I would recommend that that be one office so that people can really be very knowledgeable about the issue. Um, and so there's less confusion about where to direct um, follow-up inquiries. Um, and finally, um, change or update the service request notifications. Um, they're confusing, they repeat information, and they obviously did not have the most up-to-date status information regarding my requests. Um, there's one other area of improvement um, I've addressed in my testimony um, that I wanted to speak about. Um, first, the clearly, you know, the websites need to be looked at. You know, obviously we've heard a lot about signage at the facilities, but websites are, you know, the first point of contact um, and, you know, really drive people to the facilities. And there also are clearly websites that then refer people to CPCs that are not themselves, do not purport themselves to be the CPC's website. Um, I would venture that CPCs could create these referring websites, you know, to direct people to them. Um, also, as you've heard, many of these um, CPCs are providing some medical services, um, and they reference them on their websites, which means that the required disclosure language, which as I understand it is, quote, this facility does not have a licensed medical provider on site to provide or supervise all services, unquote. This language is therefore confusing. Um, for example, here's the website for free abortion alternatives, um, which is affiliated with Abortos NYC. And I'm quoting, notice, on rare occasions when free abortion alternatives centers are open, our medical staff, doctors, or nurses may be off-site at another location, on rounds at a hospital, or in staff training elsewhere. On the occasion when our offices are staffed by trained ultrasound technicians without immediate medical supervision, and or trained lay personnel are present only, we will notify you of this on the phone with appropriate disclosures on our door, waiting rooms, and in person, and um, at our individual offices. Do not hesitate to ask where and when our medical personnel are present for your future visit. Um, this doesn't align with what I understand to be the required disclosure language. Um, in short, having a statement about having or not having medical providers is not an indicator of a facility's offering or not offering comprehensive reproductive health care, including abortion. Um, indeed, it can be a sign of a higher level of obfuscation. Um, a small amount of clarification, you know, I believe would really go a long way. Um, and my testimony includes, you know, what I'd love to see, which would be something to the order of, this facility may have a licensed medical provider on site to provide or supervise some services, but these services may not include abortion or other forms of reproductive health care. Um, thank you very much um, for this opportunity to address the Committee on Consumer Affairs. Um, thank you for calling this oversight hearing. I do hope that these specific examples of my own experiences can provide some help and some direction in improving the reporting process. Hi, my name is Anna Bean. I'm testifying today on behalf of my organization, Lady Parts Justice League. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of enforcing Local Law 17 of 2011. 
Uh, Lady Parts Justice League is a nonprofit organization in Brooklyn founded by Liz Winstead, co creator of The Daily Show. Through comedy, we work to destigmatize abortion uh, and we support campaigns to expand access to the full range of reproductive health services and options, including abortion for women and pregnant people in New York City and across the country. Um, in 2017, uh, this past summer, we launched Expose Fake Clinics, which is a campaign uh, led in partnership with more than 40 organizations um, around the country, uh, Both that includes both reproductive rights organizations and abortion providers. Uh, we say fake clinics, <laughs> uh, as you've heard, uh, and as you know, um, because in, in their own words, these places just exist to deceive vulnerable pregnant people into coming through their doors. Um, and they deliberately look like medical providers and then provide medically inaccurate information or no medical information at all. Through our campaign, we've given people tools to closely examine the websites of fake clinics in every single state um, and then use reviewing sites like Yelp and Google business pages to leave accurate reviews so that people seeking information when faced with an unplanned pregnancy um, uh, in, in their community know just what they're walking into. Um, so of the 108 fake clinics that we've reviewed in New York State so far, um, uh, and those are just the ones we know about, uh, uh, you know, several, as you've heard, are in New York City, and few of any are complying with Local Law 17 of 2011. Um, as you've heard before, Avail, uh, uh, the fake clinic in Manhattan, states on their website that they provide ultrasounds and laboratory quality HCG urine pregnancy tests, which is the equivalent of any drugstore pregnancy test. Um, and front and center on their website, uh, they say we offer holistic care and practical resources so that you can face the future with confidence and hope. Each year, tens of thousands of women in New York City face unplanned pregnancies. Avail exists to provide you with the services, space, and support you need to make a decision about an unplanned pregnancy, all in a confidential and professional environment. Um, to me, this sounds like I'm going uh, to walk into uh, comprehensive options counseling at a medical clinic uh, and nowhere on their site. Um, do they state this facility does not have a licensed medical provider on site to provide or supervise all services in English or in Spanish? Um, the same goes for pregnancy resource services on Staten Island and Pregnancy Help New York City on 14th Street. Um, I'll skip ahead because you, you've heard a lot of this already. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we believe it's time to get tough on deception and we uh, agree with the, the recommendations so far that uh, advocates have laid out uh, for better enforcement of the law, creation of a navigable and effective complaint mechanism, training for better training for DCA inspectors and 311 operators, and transparent enforcement procedures. Um, thank you so much. Morning. I'm uh, Dr. Pat Burkhart. I'm a midwife. I'm part of the board of directors for the State Association of Licensed Midwives. I have a doctorate in public health. That's thus the doctor title. Um, I hadn't really planned to testify, so I have nothing in writing. However, having listened very long and loudly this morning, having attended the Reproductive Health Act public forum last night at which many of the organizations represented here today were present, it is clear that there is a critically growing problem with women's reproductive health rights, not only in New York State and New York City, but in the country. You all, as council people for the city, have the responsibility for the city. And so I would strongly urge, number one, that as the people responsible for city, women and health and reproductive rights, that you create, I, the, I think the bill needs amended. I had more questions pop up in my head as I heard people talk very clearly about the issues and the problems that was well-defined this morning. But what is a licensed medical facility? Who is an appropriate medical provider? You know, license, you know, and you use the word licensed provider. Well, PT, you know, physical therapy is a licensed provider. A PA is a licensed provider. Cannot practice without the supervision of a physician. So I think there needs to be some clarity about who are the right people with the right credentials to be involved in services that are to be provided to women in a decision-making process relative to their reproductive rights. I think that's going to be part of an amended law because it sounds to me like the, the local uh, law 17 needs to be strengthened, needs to be redone so that come out strong and clear about what it does. And then the solid enforcement tactics and strategies 
underpinning that law through DCA, uh, which many people have clearly defined as needing some improvement, say it that way. The other thing that strikes me, again, as someone who sits at a state association level is I see us doing band-aiding, and I understand, you know, you have to have a reasonable portion that you can take to try to make an impact on. But I think somehow in the process of developing a law for the city to consider also how you get a state law, much like what you were doing, not a law, but your activities were not limited to the city. We need comprehensive and integrated um, authorizations, laws that include women across the state, not just – so. I would strongly uh, recommend, if it, I have a right to recommend anything, that the city council at least get some understanding across the rest of the jurisdictions of the state, be it out on Long Island with the two counties out there. You know, again, lower New York versus upper New York. It gets to be um, very easy to um, make things very ineffective when we have not comprehensive and integrated laws that affect all women. Um, and most critically, not to let bureaucracy nullify the intention of the law or the enforcement of the law, uh, because that's what I was hearing today. There's just been an awful lot of bureaucratic stuff that evolves in its own right and then just gets in the way of having a, not only a solid law but a, a solid enforcement of that law. And if there's anything we, the State Association of Licensed Midwives, from the provider perspective could – help in any way would be more than willing and interested to do that. Know that more than half the licensed midwives of the state of New York work in New York City. All right, thank you. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions, but uh, we would love for everyone to please provide us with your contact information or business card. We're going to do follow-up and uh, figure out, as you mentioned, whether we should do a, any sort of amendments uh, to strengthen uh, the current law. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and this committee recognizes that, and we'll also continue our conversation with DCA. Uh, it seems like they've ramped up their, their enforcement and their, and their, um, uh, in, uh, or their, their responsibility to, to go out and, and do the work on this issue. So uh, we'll continue our conversation with the agency as well. So thank you all. I appreciate it. Uh, with that said, the uh, hearing is going to be adjourned. Thank you.